next Pats podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the Next Pats Podcast. I'm Phil Perry. Lots to get to in this week's episode. We're going to start out talking about the latest Mel Kuyper mock draft. He throws an absolutely fascinating name, the Patriots way, at number 14 overall. It's a cornerback, one of the deepest positions in this year's class. We're also going to hear from Kuyper on this year's class of tight ends. Maybe right there with corner as the deepest position in this year's draft. So a fascinating discussion there and a big name tight end set to visit the Patriots. What would it look like if the Patriots actually ended up taking a tight end in the first round? What does it mean for their roster as currently constituted? We're going to do a quick run through on prototypical Patriots that I don't think we've really, we've touched on enough in the podcast here. Hopefully you've been keeping up with those on NBC sports, Boston.com, but I wanted to throw just a, a few names at you from each position day one, day two, and day three guys on the offensive side of the ball. We'll get to the defensive side next week. I just want to catch you guys up on some of our quote unquote prototypes. I love, I love spending time on that series each and every year. It just really helps me get familiar with the kinds of guys that the Patriots based on their history might like. Then we've got two interviews for you. I told you there was a lot to get to in this episode. We're talking to Connor Rogers, newly minted member of the NBC Sports family, covered the Jets for a long time. So we're going to talk about what the Jets might do in the draft. Also going to be talking about day two options for the Patriots at positions of need. And then we're going to talk to a guy. This is an old interview that we're breaking out of the can. Pop it open, Skull Crusher. Cam Smith, the corner from South Carolina. He might be a day two option himself. Heck, he might even sneak into day one, the back end of the first round. So athletic, I think could play in a variety of different schemes, but it was fun to talk to Cam Smith at the Super Bowl. It's a long time ago now, right? But still got some great insight from Cam Smith. And one of the best lines in college football was dropped at the microphone by Cam Smith last year in 2022. You're going to want to make sure you stick around for his take on that and much, much more. But first, let's start with Kuyper. At number 14 overall in the 2023 NFL Draft, Mel Kuyper, friend of the podcast, Mel Kuyper, the great Mel Kuyper, has the Patriots taking Christian Gonzalez, cornerback out of Oregon. This, to me, would be a home run selection in a draft that is not necessarily chock full of blue chip talents. Gonzalez is a blue chip talent, six foot two, over 200 pounds, all the athleticism you could ever want. Ran in the four threes at the combine. Unbelievably smooth in his transitions. And we know just how much the Patriots value footwork at the cornerback spot, especially. How do you change direction? How do you flip your hips and run with that? Whether it's an X receiver or maybe it's even a speedy little slot from the interior. Flip your hips and run down the field to be able to be step for step with that player. Make a play on the football when given the opportunity. That's Christian Gonzalez. Height. Weight, speed would give the Patriots something that they don't have. Quite frankly, it's something that most teams in the NFL don't have when you're talking about this specific combination of length and movement skills. Christian Gonzalez, to me, at a position of need as well. I do call cornerback a position of need for the Patriots and specifically somebody that you feel confident in on the boundary. Jonathan Jones, Marcus Jones, Jack Jones. I think they're all starting caliber players. But when you look at that group, Of three right there, you're talking about undersized in different ways, but undersized really across the board. Christian Gonzalez gives you that bigger option so that when you see that true number one option on the other side of the ball, you have somebody who can match up. And we know how much the Patriots love to play man coverage. And lucky for them, there are all kinds of man coverage options at that position in this year's draft. Christian Gonzalez, some might say he's the number one option. If you're looking for that kind of player, Devin Witherspoon, to me, I think would be the Patriots favorite because of the physicality with which he plays the position. That's something that, you know, Bill Belichick appreciates tackling ability, even for somebody whose primary job is to cover. And that might be an area where Christian Gonzalez is lacking a little bit. I spoke to a defensive assistant recently who said, yeah, Witherspoon is a little undersized, quote unquote, undersized, but he's almost six feet tall and he's 180 ish pounds. He actually weighed in at 184 at his pro day, which I thought was a pretty good number for him. But he plays like he's 6'2", 200 pounds. And he is looking to lay you out 
when the football comes your way. Gonzalez, meanwhile, for all the athleticism, for all the traits that he has, I won't call him soft, but just not as feisty as you might want out of somebody at that position. That's what evaluators would tell you. He doesn't necessarily play to that size in terms of the physical aspects of the game the way Witherspoon does in a slightly smaller package. Like I said, home run pick for me if Christian Gonzalez ends up with the Patriots. But let's hear from Kuiper. He recently had a conference call with media from across the country about what he thinks might be available to the Patriots at number 14 overall if it's not Gonzalez. Is there a game-changing type there that will be sitting there for Bill Belichick in the New England Patriots? Or if your brain works the way mine does, would it be better for them to maybe trade down? That is still a very realistic option in my opinion. But here's Kuiper on who the Patriots might be looking at right in the middle of the first round. When it comes to the New England Patriots at uh, 14, what do you see as the the best fits and and options? And is this a position where the Patriots could land an impact player? Well, I think they certainly have a chance to with uh, with Christian Gonzalez or Jackson Smith and Jigba. They go offensive line. There's going to be somebody there that can be an attractive addition as a rookie coming in and starting. Uh, Gonzalez is the bigger corner. And in the AFC against all these elite quarterbacks, matching up in coverage is critical. And, you know, Gonzalez would give them something in terms of length that they need. Uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba had gone a little earlier. They could certainly use him. He was great in the slot. He can also play wide. Uh, I haven't taken the offensive tackle, Matthew Bergeron from Syracuse. He was a Canadian kid who really got better and keeps getting better as a pass protector. That's where he has to keep improving. He'll have five sacks this year, cut down a little bit on the penalties, uh, moves people, moves defenders off the ball, has the talent, I think, to be a good pass protector once he settles in in the NFL. So I gave him to the, the Patriots in round two. So uh, I think the receiver, the lineman, <laughs> excuse me, the, um, the corner, uh, it could fall pretty well in the first round where they have, like I say, three very good options. If a Gonzalez were there, if a Darnell Wright, the right tackle from Tennessee were there, or if they got lucky and a Jackson Smith and Jigba were there, what would they do? I don't know, but that would be a good option to have. So you hear him rattle off a bunch of names there, all kinds of options, all different types of positions as well. And I do think it's a, it's a relevant conversation for us to have if corner – is in fact one of the deepest positions in this year's draft, is it worthy then of being spent? Is it wise then to spend the number 14 overall selection on someone at that position? Again, with Gonzalez, I would say yes. With Witherspoon, I would say, of course. Maybe even Joey Porter, another first-round option, man-to-man, all kinds of coverage ability and doing the things that the Patriots want to do on the back end, all kinds of length, really disruptive at the catch point. Deontay Banks, I would even include in that conversation. One of the best athletes in this year's class. To me, he's a little bit of a combination of Christian Gonzalez and Devin Witherspoon. I say that because he's physical too now. One of the most efficient tacklers in the country, regardless of position. So he brings that hammer aspect that the Patriots like, I think, at that position. But he also has the 4-3 speed, which Witherspoon, while he's fast, ran in the low 4-4s, doesn't have to quite the same level. So all these options, is it worth spending that 14 overall pick on one of those? Or are you better off if you don't love the the top end talent in the draft at receiver, for instance, if Jackson Smith and Jigba is there for you at 14, are you better off taking the scarcer resource, quote unquote, and getting the receiver and waiting a little while and maybe getting the cornerback later? It's a fascinating discussion for us to have. I batted around in my own brain. I'd love to hear from you in the comments on YouTube. Leave us a review on Apple iTunes, you know, in that comment section there. If you had the opportunity to go for a Smith and Jigbo or a Christian Gonzalez, I think if you just polled the NFL and evaluators across the NFL, they would say, well, Gonzalez looks like the better pick and the more valuable player. But again, scarcity and, and playing the game that is the NFL draft. Would you rather have, for instance, Jackson Smith and Jigba in the first round and Cam Smith in the second round or Christian Gonzalez in the first round and then getting a little lesser sort of receiver in the second round? Maybe it's Tyler Scott, friend of the podcast from Cincinnati, another slot, different type of slot 
from Jackson Smith and Jigba. But those are the kinds of combinations that you might be talking about and that I think are, are, are worthy of debate. Okay, let's get to the other deepest position in this year's draft class at tight end. We've got more sound from Mel Kuyper on this class of tight ends. Unbelievably deep. Maybe the deepest ever. Certainly the deepest of the last 10 years. Certainly the deepest that I have ever covered since I started covering the draft back in the early 2010s for NBC Sports Boston. Let's hear from Kuyper on that position group. Mel, love the mock draft. Um, If I saw it right, I had four tight ends in the first 42 picks and maybe five in the overall first two rounds. How rare is that, you know, um, for that position? And I'm intrigued by Darnell Washington and the 45 catches. And I'm wondering, is that just because they didn't throw it to him? Or is there more there where, you know, the 45 catches is sort of a knock on him? No, in terms of Darnell, it's because Darnell you know, is a freakish talent. It's six, six and a half, 265 pounds with his arm length and the way he runs. That's a nat- matchup nightmare. I could see him going in the first round. I- I've been going in the early second, uh, but he's a dynamic talent. You say, well, the cat, well, Brock Bowers is a great talent too. He's been there, you know, since his freshman year. Brock is a going to be a junior this year. Will be draft eligible in 2024. Should be a high pick. You got to get the ball to Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers is one of the tough, one of the best tight ends in college football over the last couple of years. And you know, so you got Brock Bowers catching the ball, and then you got Darnell Washington getting his passes. You know, you know. That's the thing. I thought Stetson Bennett did a good job distributing the football to the guy, but you got to get Brock Bowers to six to eight, ten catches a game. So that kind of limits the amount of opportunities for Darnell, but he certainly showed he could do that. Uh, like I said, you don't find many tight ends with his size, his athleticism, and his speed. Uh, Luke Musgrave is an, is an off, is a guy you can move around. Uh, he's a move tight end. Uh, he's a, a guy like people said, Mike, a Mike Gesicki type. I think he could be really good at six, five and change, almost six, six. 250 pounds or run like he does. And he had the injury, so he didn't play much this year, was back healthy for the senior bowl. Uh, that's why I pushed him to the second round. So you really you have, and you got some sleepers at this spot. I mean, uh, you know, you got some guys, this, this tight end spot goes a little bit deeper than just the top five, six. Tucker Craft of South Dakota State came back from the injury. The offense didn't get him the ball that much, but he's got talent. Sam Laporte at Iowa, you can move outside as well. Uh, I mentioned Schoonmaker. Uh, Zach Koontz at Old Dominion, formerly of Penn State, tested great. Uh, Will Mallory, Miami, ran well. Cameron Latou, uh, Payne Durham didn't run great, but had a really good year at Purdue. And then Davis Allen at Clemson. So that you can go 14, 15 deep at tight end or guys that certainly could get drafted and probably drafted within the first five rounds. Now, why is this discussion fascinating for me right now as we're recording on Wednesday, April 12th? Well, it was reported earlier today by Adam Schefter that Dalton Kincaid, in the eyes of some, the number one overall tight end in this year's draft class. You may get others to say Michael Mayer from Notre Dame, but Dalton Kincaid, an unbelievably dynamic receiving option at the position. Number one, he's been, he's been cleared to play, excuse me, cleared to play. Hasn't really worked out before the draft here because he's dealt with a back injury that he suffered late in the season last season, but he is good to go. According to his doctors, Schefter also reporting that tomorrow again, We're recording this on Wednesday, so on Thursday of this week, April 13th, Kincaid will be paying the Patriots a visit. He will be one of their top 30. Shouldn't be calling them top 30 visits. I understand that. We'll just call it a 30 visit. He will be one of their 30 visits leading up to the draft. And the reason we don't call it a top 30 visit is because the players who visit aren't necessarily the top players on a team's draft board. Oftentimes, while they will bring their favorites to whatever building it is, the Patriots and any other team we're talking about, oftentimes you bring players in to have questions answered, whether it's about character, background, or injury. And so this could be the case with Kincaid and visiting the Patriots. Maybe the Patriots just want the best and most up-to-date medical information on a guy who is, I think, perceived as a middle-of-the-first-round type of option. But if they truly are interested in drafting Dalton Kincaid, I like the idea. I really like the idea. Now, depending on how the board falls, right? If Christian Gonzalez is still there, I would say that would be the option you should go with over Kincaid. Same for Devin Witherspoon. Same for Jackson Smith and Jigba. But I would have Kincaid very close behind those types of options because to me, you need a game-changing player in the passing game. And Kincaid has the potential to be just that. Is he Travis Kelsey? No. 
Travis Kelsey's a future Hall of Famer. Nobody's Travis Kelsey. But can he give you something along the lines of a better version of Zach Ertz, which is what Daniel Jeremiah has said before? If you look at Daniel Jeremiah's top 50 players in his most recent rankings, he has Kincaid as a top 10 player in this draft, number nine overall. And he said he could be, could be an improvement on what Zach Ertz brought to the league for a long time. That to me is worthy of a first round investment, especially with Bill O'Brien here now, especially with Bill Belichick loving that tight end position the way he does and the way that you know he wants to try to find matchups for these types of players. Again, Kincaid hasn't tested, but at but at six foot four, six three and a half, 246 pounds, he has enough size. He is clearly enough of an athlete from the Patriots' point of view. Unbelievable in terms of contested catches, in terms of what he does after the catch, just to be able to work the middle of the field the way it looks like the Patriots want to work the middle of the field. I mean, look at how they're built right now. We talk about signing Juju Smith-Schuster to play in the middle of the field. Hunter Henry and Mike Kosicki to play in the middle of the field. Now, would Dalton Kincaid be overkill in terms of giving the Patriots middle of the field options, which is where, to me, Mac Jones is at his best when he's looking between the numbers? You could argue that. But to me, none of those players I just mentioned should prevent you or should deter you from drafting somebody who would immediately come in and be the most talented option of that group. It gets back to that conversation we had with Jeremiah earlier this offseason, talking about receivers who may fit with the Patriots in this year's draft and what they already have at that position on the roster. He said, well, do you really have to think about that? Does it matter <laughs> if a receiver compliments the group they already have? Are they so talented in the building as it stands right now that they should be considering those options in the locker room for the Patriots when they're on the clock at 14 overall? No. Whoever you get at 14 overall, whether it's Jackson Smith and Jigber or Dalton Kincaid, those guys immediately become your top option in the passing game. So the Patriots don't have enough talent already in-house to be, I think, shaping their decision-making process around those individuals. So to me, if Kincaid is there and you don't love what else is on the board and you don't love you know, maybe some of the trade-down opportunities that you might have or you don't feel great about Maybe you don't have a trade down opportunity. It takes two to tango, obviously. But if you're somebody like me who would think trading down and somehow landing Zay Flowers closer to the end of the first round would be ideal and then picking up another pick on day two, that would be a tremendous outcome for them. Maybe you don't feel confident in your ability to be able to make sure that you can do that if you trade down. Maybe you can't trade down at all. If that's the case, Kincaid to me is a tremendous fit. Then I think the fun question becomes, do you pair him with another? In this really deep tight end class, Kincaid would be in more of the move tight end category. But then would you add a Y tight end to grow and develop with and come up with the same sort of pairing or try to that you came up with in 2010? Rob Gronkowski in the second round, Aaron Hernandez in the fourth. You got your Y tight end, you got your move tight end. This situation with Kincaid, would be reversed. You'd be spending the early pick on the move tight end, but there are plenty of Y options, legitimate blockers at that tight end spot that depending on where you will, you're willing to spend a pick, you know, maybe Tucker Kraft from South Dakota state, who's a true Y, maybe he gets to the third round. Now you're talking about spending a first and a third round pick at a tight end position. We already have two veteran, highly paid guys, relatively highly paid. Not sure how realistic that is, right? Okay, well, maybe it's the fourth or the fifth for somebody like Michigan's Luke Schoonmaker. Or maybe you wait even a little bit later and you pick up Payne Durham from Purdue. These guys all can block. They all have, I think, potential as receivers, as true dual threats. Now you have Kincaid, who even though he's he's a little bit undersized, he's not that undersized. And even though he's not a devastating blocker, he's a willing blocker. Now you have something that you can really build on Moving forward, I, that to me, I don't know how exciting it would be for fans at large for the Patriots to take a tight end. But again, for a team that needs as much help as it can get in the passing game, taking a potentially great receiver at the tight end position could be their best option at 14 overall. All right, let's run through some of our prototypical Patriots. Again, hopefully you guys have been following along on NBCSportsBoston.com. But I just wanted to... Give you a little taste. 
give you a little, just a little something something on our prototypical Patriots at every offensive position, and then you can go seek out the article again on the website. Quarterbacks, which we uh, posted weeks ago now, it feels like, but day one, the day one option that fits best for the Patriots is actually Hendon Hooker, in my opinion. When we're talking about the the boxes that need to be checked for the Patriots, and the reason why is the experience level. You, know, you look at some of the guys that are even projected to be taken at the top part of the first round. Patriots aren't going to have, in all likelihood, an opportunity to take some of those guys. But the reason why I would say Hooker's an even better fit on paper than they are is because of the experience level. The Patriots still, under Bill Belichick, have not drafted a quarterback who did not spend four years in college. That's not the case with some of these guys that are being talked about in the top half of day one. We're getting a little creative here. I know I said I'd give you day two options. I'm not sure. Hendon Hooker might be the only real day two option at quarterback because he might end up going in the second round. Who knows? He's sort of a borderline player. So I'm going to give you two day three guys um, because I think that's sort of where that value is at the position. I know the Eagles just got a Super Bowl starting quarterback in the second round a few years ago, but let's call Hooker the day one option. I'll give you two day three options. Let's go with DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson out of UCLA. He gives the Patriots a lot of what they're looking for statistically. They also spent obviously a lot of time with him at the Shrine Bowl. And then my day three option would be Houston's Clayton Toon. Better athlete than I gave him credit for. Ridiculous relative athletic score. And, and somebody who I think you'd be comfortable with scrambling around a little bit and, and making plays off schedule every once in a while. But he's also prolific in what was a prolific passing game for the Cougars. So he checks every production marker that the Patriots usually draft. Clayton Toon does. At receiver, the day one option, Jackson Smith and Jibba. We talked about him so much, but when you talk about quickness, Julian Edelman style quickness. They tested almost identically during their pre-draft, their respective pre-draft processes. Uh, so at six foot one though, so with more size than Edelman. And I think, um, you know, an ability to like Edelman play both inside and out that could have huge value on day one for Mac Jones in the Patriots offense. My day two option that I'm liking more and more as a Patriots fit lately. He's not the biggest guy, but he is a freaky athlete. It would be Marvin Mims out of Oklahoma, ran a 4.3840. So you're talking about elite, elite speed, even though he's 5'11, 183. Again, not the biggest, but he does sort of meet the floors of where the, the Patriots have drafted in the past, uh, even drafting some second rounders in the past. Bethel Johnson uh, for the Patriots, second round guy. Let's pull up his numbers right now Texas AM, 2003. 43840 at 5'11, 201. So he was thicker than Mims was, but that's the kind of athlete you're talking about with Marvin Mims. I think a legitimate deep threat from the slot. I think he could play outside as well. I think he's that athletic. He's that good down the field. Uh, I like Marvin Mims a lot. We talked a lot about Jonathan Mingo. We talked about Tyler Scott. Those are day two guys as well, but let's give Mims some love here. Day three, my cousin, A.T. Perry. Kidding. Not related, I don't think. If we are, he took all the athleticism in the family. Uh, six foot three, just under 200 pounds. So sort of a lankier, taller option. But I've seen people compare him to George Pickens because of some of the contested catches that he can make. Tested really well as well. Uh, so some, somebody to keep an eye on as a boundary option on day three. How about for the people out there who like the undrafted receiver market? Is there anybody out there like that? Or is it just me? David Durden. Out of West Florida, Division II, West Florida, former Red Sox draft pick. You can learn more about Durden, again, on the website. But he tested like a banshee and would be immediately, to me, a special teams option. Gunner, return man, quick, fast, pretty good size, over six feet. David Durden, Division II. He might even get drafted. I know Dane Brugler from The Athletic, friend of the pod, has him as a sixth or seventh round pick. But if he ends up... Um, in New England, you heard it here first, okay? You heard it here first. Big running back, B. John Robinson would be your day one option. Best running back in the draft since Saquon Barkley. Day two, how about Bijan's teammate, Roshan Johnson? Has played a ton on special teams, runs through contact, good size, almost 220 pounds at about six feet. This guy has just about everything you're looking for. He's just not as physically gifted as Robinson was and had to play second fiddle. With the Patriots, he'd be a great, a great option to play behind Ramondre Stevenson, try to save Stevenson some reps so that he's fresher later in the year. And then my day three option, I'm cheating here. I'm cheating because I'm going to go with a fullback option. It's Derek Parrish 
out of Houston. Another Houston option here. Okay, so I don't know if the Patriots feel as strongly about some of these um, Cougars as I do and have the last couple of years when you're including Marcus Jones as well. But Derek Parrish, 6 feet, 240 pounds, 241 actually is what he weighed in at, at his pro day. Ridiculous athlete. 45840, 37-inch vertical, 407 short shuttle, 6763 cone at 241 pounds. That is absurd. Now, can he play fullback for the Patriots? Well, he has this defense to offense transition thing down, which they seem to like. <laughs> James Devlin was a defensive lineman at Brown, became a fullback, obviously. Jakob Johnson was a linebacker, then became a tight end, then became a fullback for the Patriots. The one area where Parrish is lacking a little bit compared to those other two guys, and Parrish was an edge defender at Houston really for his entire career, but played fullback at the Shrine Bowl and has embraced that change for his ability to, to make it at the next level. He's a little smaller than they were. So six feet, 241, a little different than 6'3", 255, which is what James Devlin was, or 6'3", 250, the way Jakob Johnson was listed. So is he going to be on their radar as a fullback? I think he should be. And even if not necessarily as a fullback, as a, as a special teams option, as a Nate Ebner type, again, Patriots are loaded up on special team specialists. I don't know how many more they need, but I think he'll fill that role at the next level, if not fullback as well, and be pretty effective. He's a rare athlete. My sub running back. So those are my big backs on uh, day one, two, and three. Sub running backs, Jameer Gibbs, probably the best receiving back in this year's class. Absolutely dynamic out of Alabama. Day two option, Tajay Spears from Tulane, practice player of the week at the Senior Bowl unbelievable quickness and change of direction ability, really good hands, really willing in pass protection, just over 200 pounds as well. So he hits a marker there for them. Uh, and the day three option for me would be Israel Abanaconda from Pitt. Great athlete, about 215 pounds and lit it up at the combine. Not a big back playing style kind of player though, more of a sub back in terms of where he probably would be comfortable early in his career at least, would give you some return ability as well. But he's only going to be 20 years old when he's drafted. So some runway there for him to improve. Tight end, we just talked about Dalton Kincaid. He'd be the day one option. Day two, Darnell Washington, who we talked about before. Behemoth, block first, but with potential certainly as a receiver because of the quickness that he has. Luke Schoonmaker would be my day three option. My UDFA would be Blake Whitehart out of Wake Forest. Because I just want to read for you some of the testing numbers here. 6'4", 245. So maybe just a shade under in terms of the weight, what they would be looking for in a Y tight end. But 4740 is right around what they're usually looking for. 35 and a half inch vertical jump, right around what they're usually looking for. And then the three cone at his pro day, 677 three cone at almost 250 pounds. That's the kind of workout that gets you a contract at the end of day three when maybe you didn't hear your name called or gets you drafted at the very end of the draft because the team is intrigued by your physical ability, what you might be able to do on special teams. Um, that size and speed combination is is pretty rare that Whiteheart is bringing to the table. So I like him as a potential Patriot late in the draft. Offensive lineman, Darnell Wright, day one, University of Tennessee, lots of experience, stonewalled Will Anderson in their matchup. You think Bill Belichick would appreciate that? I do. Day two option would be Cody Mock. Great, at, another great athlete, another great three-cone time. 7133 three cone at 300 pounds. Now, to me, he's almost a, an Antonio Garcia type in terms of you might have to develop him a little bit if you want him to be a tackle. And Garcia never ended up panning out. He was sub 300 pounds when he was drafted, but could play almost any position, even worked out at center during the senior bowl. No front teeth, great long flowing locks out of the back of the helmet. He's a character. He's supposedly a, a, a football character guy that would really add to the room. And he is, he is a rare athlete, makes him a prototypical Patriot. Blake Freeland, another rare athlete from BYU. Maybe a little long and lean to play tackle, but on day three, you're not getting, you're not getting uh, Trent Williams, okay? So Blake Freeland from BYU, the numbers he posted, would be a good option there. Day one at guard, Steve Avila from TCU. Day two, Chandler Zavala from NC State. Really good test numbers is dealt with injury. So who knows how long he ends up lasting in the draft. My guy on day three has been UCLA's John Gaines. Six foot four, 303 pounds. The athleticism is off the charts. He's played just about every position for the Bruins. Um, you know, maybe Adrian Clem has a pretty good idea of what Gaines will be able to do coming from the Pac-12 at Oregon. 
you know, and, and Clem was the offensive line coach at UCLA. Those guys, as far as I can tell, did not cross over, did not cross over for the Bruins. But again, if Clem's familiar with him and familiar with his athleticism, this guy is a day three pick easy. Maybe he's even a day two guy for a team that values the athleticism portion of it. 501, 40 yard dash, 94th percentile, 32 and a half inch vertical, 93rd percentile. 114 inch broad jump, 97th percentile. 7313 cone, 96th percentile. Short shuttle of 445, 94th percentile. Elite, elite, elite across the board, John Gaines is. So, would be a steal, in my opinion, on day three if you're looking for some interior depth. Okay, there's your prototypes on the offensive side of the ball. We'll get into the defensive side next week. But right now, let's get into some more day two options with Connor Rogers. And we're specifically talking about positions of need here for the Patriots receiver corner. Those are the sexy spots, right? And that's what we're going to be hitting on with Connor, as well as what the jets might do at number 13 overall, right before the Patriots. Here's Connor. All right. Very excited now to have with us Connor Rogers, newly minted member of the NBC sports family fantasy football, happy hour covering the draft for NBC also does great work for pro football focus with the NFL Stock Exchange podcast with our guy, Trevor Sikama, another friend of the podcast. Connor, thanks so much for being with us here, man. Dude, I'm excited. Thanks so much for having me, Phil. I can't wait to talk to you today. I know we got a lot of fun draft stuff to get through. Well, there's a lot of draft thoughts I know rattling around in that brain of yours, underneath that perfect hair of yours, <laughs> by the way. If you're watching Thank on YouTube, you. I, I'm going to try to hide my jealousy as we get through the conversation here. But we have a four-pack of questions that I want to throw your way. And I want to start with the Jets, because I know that that is and has been your wheelhouse for a long time. And the Jets, interestingly enough, pick right before the Patriots this year. And I think, interestingly enough, could be interested in the same sorts of positions as New England this year. So this is really going to impact what Bill Belichick does, in my opinion, at 14 overall. So I put it to you. What are the Jets doing at 13? You're absolutely on it. I look at those two teams as being very O-line centric, and I wouldn't even rule out pass rush centric for either as well, but I definitely look at the top of this offensive line class. And, you know, some of those teams in the teens should be really thankful that we probably have four quarterbacks going in front because that can give you a shot at, I don't think Peter Skaronsky is there. There's just so much polish for him to be a good NFL player. But can a Broderick Jones from Georgia, who's a true left tackle, can play on the right side, I think, if he need to make that adjustment. But a true left tackle, Paris Johnson from Ohio State is somebody that started at guard two years ago and played left tackle last year. And then you get into a, a different tier, but a really good tier, the two right tackles and Darnell Wright from Tennessee, uh, who has played left tackle, but he's a true right tackle. And Dewan Jones from Ohio State, who played on the same line as Paris Johnson. So I think the Jets are all over that market. I think that's why... They've been very, uh, you know, steady in not giving that pick to Green Bay because it's so important for them to restock their offensive line. And then you look at New England. What fascinates me here, right, is that maybe they're both in on the offensive line, but maybe not in the same exact capacity where the Jets, I think, would favor a true left tackle like Broderick Jones. Why look at New England's roster right now? Why not slide in Darnell Wright or Dewan Jones, a big hulking right tackle if you think Trent is fine this year on the left side? So I think both are all over the offensive line, but I think there's enough of those prospects at that tier to go around that each could walk away with a new starting tackle. I'm fascinated from New England's perspective as to what happens with Trent Brown after this draft because, and these are under the radar signings, these are names that most of our listeners, Connor, who are obsessed with the Patriots and know, you know, player one through, you know, 63, if you're including the practice squad, usually, they sign Riley Reef, give him real money. It's, a, it's essentially a one-year deal, but they give him real money. He's going yeah. to be on the roster. They also signed Calvin Anderson. Again, a reserve tackle, but they gave him $4 million guaranteed. He's going to be on the roster. You only bring, generally speaking, three tackles to your games. So if they draft one in the first round, does that mean Trent is out? Does that mean Trent gets traded? They try to free up some money there to make a move elsewhere. I, I wouldn't rule out tackle for the Patriots at 14, no question. But I, I do think they've gone into it now with, with three guys that they could feel comfortable with going into game day if they really wanted to. I, I do want to ask you this at 14 for the Patriots, because we've had some big names in the mock draft space, Connor come up with a very interesting selection for the Patriots in the first round. And it's Bijan Robinson out of Texas. Now let's do a little fill in the blank here. 
the Patriots drafting Bijan Robinson at 14 overall would be what, Connor? I think great for them. And I know it's not popular. I really know. And listen, I'm I'll stunned. tell you, I'm I'll stunned. tell you this. Now, would you love it if they could trade back and still get him? Of course. But here's the issue, right? I, I put this pick to them a couple months ago, and it was not received. And on the Stock Exchange pod for PFF, we do mock drafts every Monday. So you're going to run into, we've covered every scenario with New England, whether it's all the offensive linemen, B. John Robinson, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. Zay Flowers is on their radar. Of course, Brian Branch from Alabama. But the reason when I brought up Bijan as as at least an idea is that he's not just a running back. He can truly, I think, motion out and handle wide receiver reps for you. I really see him as a, when Todd Gurley had those two elite years on the Rams under Sean McVay, like he could rip off 2,000 yards from scrimmage in a season. I view him as that kind of player over a longer stretch. And I think with New England, they need something that scares you on offense. And right now, they don't have it. I, I like Juju Smith-Schuster a lot. I think he's a nice addition. I like that New England has always been willing to be a power run football team, trying to be bigger and more physical than you in the trenches. And we know they got away from that at times last summer, but New England at Belichick's roots, they can be that and they could be a two tight end team, but you want somebody. And I love Ramondre Stevenson. This is nothing to take away from Ramondre, but if you want a creative player that can truly take over the game, every time the ball is in his hands, it's impossible to kill a team outside the top 10 that takes Bijan Robinson, especially when there is a need for more offensive skill talent. So do I value positions differently than running back? Do I value the running back position with a little less value? No doubt. But he's a top five player in a draft that, you know, a little whisper doesn't have a lot of blue chip talent. If you walk away with a blue chip talent that makes your offense better, helps out your young quarterback, helps out Bill O'Brien, I can't kill that pick. That part of it, I agree with, right? You feel like you've got a sure thing there in terms of somebody that you're going to be able to plop into your offense and get better immediately. Whereas, you know, I would look at the receiver position. I like a lot of the receivers in this year's draft, but like if you take Quentin Johnston at 14 overall, I don't think that's a guarantee to necessarily take no. your offense to the next level because there are plenty of questions. If he hits, if everything goes well, if his hands are right, if he can grasp the, you know, all this stuff, all these questions, if they get answered in the right way, then maybe. But there is some certainty to B. John Robinson that there isn't to other players. So that would be interesting to see because, again, you mentioned the name. Ramondre Stevenson's already their best offensive player. Now you got two running backs as your two. Like, are you you're going pro formations, Connor? Are we going, we're taking yeah, it back right. to, like, you know, 1992? Like Split backs, if, yeah. If anybody's going to do it, it might be Bill Belichick, right? So uh, that would be really interesting. I did want to ask you because I know you guys just ranked your favorite receivers in this year's draft class for the stock exchange. Is there a day two guy? Because we've talked about a lot of the, the day one guys and we've talked about them extensively, but we've seen day two guys become legitimate number ones, right? Whether it's DK or AJ Brown or T Higgins, there's, there's been a number of them over the last couple of years. Is there a day two receiver in this year's draft that you think has the potential to turn into a true number one? Yeah, and he's perfect for New England and Cedric Tillman from Tennessee. You know, Jalen Hyatt got all the love this year. I get it. He caught the five touchdowns against Alabama. Tillman dealt with a serious ankle injury, probably came back too soon from it. Turn on the 2021 tape. Number one, it blows my mind how we, we get with narratives. Cedric Tillman is bigger than Quentin Johnston. He is, and I think he's faster, um, and I think he has way better hands, and that's not me thinking it. It's me knowing it. I mean, he hasn't really dropped a lot of passes over the last two years. I think around five on 140 something targets. Quentin Johnson, he fights the ball like crazy for all the gifted measurables. He is not a natural pass catcher. Tillman is right in their range at 46. I, honestly, I think that's right around where he's going. He's a big bodied blocker. He's physical. He's got build up speed. Maybe he doesn't have acceleration off the line of scrimmage, but he could beat you with long strides down the field. He's excellent after the catch. He understands how to use his frame to shield when plucking the ball out of the air. And ultimately he's somebody that I think has so much upside left on the table. I, he really reminds me of Cortland Sutton coming out of SMU. They play the same brand of football. And I am telling everybody that will listen, if you flipped his years, if Tillman got hurt in 2021, but had his 2021 season in 2022, he'd be a first round pick. There's no doubt about it. And he wasn't able to go to the senior bowl because of that injury as well. So I look at Tillman and think, man, whoever takes him in that top 50 fringe range, you have New England there at 46. Uh, a couple other teams that could still use wide receiver before them, whether it's the Titans, the Panthers as well. But I just think he's a perfect player in terms of that physicality. I love that. And this is why I love getting different perspectives on this year's class is because there are so many varying 
opinions. And Tillman's really not a name that, that we've heard much linked to New England or that we've even discussed much. You know, Jonathan Mingo is a name that's catching, I feel yeah. like, a lot of steam lately based on how the, the pre-draft process and his workouts have gone, and that makes sense. But Tillman's another name that we should be considering for the Patriots on the outside. I have the last question for you, Connor, is essentially the same question, but at corner, right? Because, again, we're very focused on the first round. We know if you're looking at tackles after the first round, you're probably not getting a dude. But it is possible at receiver, and I think it is possible at corner as well, especially in New England where Bill Belichick has a long history of turning late-round picks, mid-round picks, even undrafted guys into high-end corners. So is there a day-two corner that you look at and say, that guy could be a lockdown guy in a couple of years? Yeah, two for me uh, would be DJ Turner from Michigan, a great athlete. I think he plays in a system that translates well to the NFL because – at Michigan, they're asked to press a lot, and he can live in that system. He's got incredible recovery speed. He's twitchy. He understands just how to stay sticky and in phase. And then you look at somebody like Terrell Smith from Minnesota, a shrine guy. New England loves those long corners and the ability to run, and that's what Smith has. He's somebody that can beat you up at the line of scrimmage. He started to find the football. The long strides and the vertical routes are really, really impressive. So he's probably the most underrated corner in the draft. Everybody talks about, of course, Gonzalez, Witherspoon, Porter, Cam Smith, Deontay Banks, Gilly Ringo. I get it. I I really do. But you're all over it that, especially when you're a a team like New England, that they just seem to find talent at corner and properly develop it and, more importantly, properly utilize it. You can wait till day two of this draft because there's just so many guys like Turner and Brents and even uh, a guy like Julius Brents is who I just said. And then, of course, Terrell Smith as well. So length and speed is the name of the game in this corner class, and it will be there in rounds two and three. I'm so glad you mentioned Terrell Smith because which coaching staff, the entirety of their coaching staff, they know in Vegas for the Shrine Bowl. It's the New England Patriots, so they Perfect. got to know that guy really well. I thought he had a great week for the Shrine Bowl there, and, and again, he has a lot of the traits that I could see Bill Belichick licking his chops over and trying to turn that guy into a starting corner down the line. Connor Rogers, thank you so much for being with us here, man. Dropping some knowledge on us for this year's draft. We're all kind of cramming right now with less than a month uh, before the first round comes around, but it was great chatting with you, man. And hopefully we'll be able to do this again soon. Now that you're, you're part of the Peacock fam, man, we're happy to have you. I'm so happy to be here. It was great talking to you. And anytime you need me, I'm, I'm down to rip off as many names at corner and offensive line that you need. We're, we're hitting them all. Connor, we're hitting them all essentially during this pre-draft process. So we're going to have to have you back and we'll chop it up again sometime soon. Thanks, man. Great stuff there from Connor, NBC Sports, fantasy football, happy hour all over the draft. Jets pre and post. So, you know, he's tapped in there with what they're doing down in Jersey. So really interesting to hear him indicate that tackles probably looking like the spot for the Jets, especially with Aaron Rodgers expected to be in town soon there. Great info from Connor Rogers. I love the pick of Cedric Tillman too, as a good day two option, somebody who could turn into a legit number one. That's somebody I know Todd McShay is high on as well. Big body guy, not necessarily going to, to run away from you, but he's a good enough athlete for sure. He's just not quite as fast as his teammate Jalen Hyatt, who all he did was run away from people, but it's six, three, two to run a four, five, four, That's pretty impressive, and he has legitimate lower body explosiveness when you look at the broad jump of 10 foot eight there. So Cedric Tillman in the second round, if the Patriots are still looking for a wideout and they want a boundary guy that they feel like could be immediately useful, depending on whether or not Devontae Parker is actually available to them, which we know can be an issue at times, uh, that's a name for us to keep an eye on, no question. Now, finally, we don't want to pigeonhole this player as a day two option because he might go in the first round cam smith out of south carolina we've talked about his teammate quite a bit darius rush because of the senior bowl he had and he lit it up at the combine ran in the four three six foot two but cam smith at six one 180 now he's he is slight as well but he ran a four four three not too shabby 38 inch vertical and a wow a whopping 11 two broad jump that's 96 percentile so he gets a little grabby maybe at times he might have some issues here and there when it comes to picking up flags but for a team that values athleticism and size at that position needs some size at that position cam smith for the patriots seems like a fit to me could they get him at 46 overall in the second round let's get to our conversation with cam smith from back in arizona at the super bowl 
are very happy now to have with us Cam Smith, cornerback out of South Carolina, one of the best corners in the 2023 NFL Draft. Cam, thanks for being with us. I'm glad to be here. All right, Cam, what is life like right now for you? As somebody who's getting ready for the draft, getting ready for the combine, you were just, it was just announced to us at least, I don't know when you found out, but just invited to the combine, so congratulations on that, Appreciate no surprise you. there. But what's the process like right now for you to get ready for that combine, get ready for this next phase of your career? I mean, right now, I mean, coming from like just college atmosphere, like always having something to do, like after workouts, you got class, stuff like that. So just coming in, like having, like not really having any class and stuff like that, and just working out in the mornings and then in the afternoon, uh, having a lift, it's just really like just kind of simple. It's kind of just living a simple life, really. I get just, to focus on your craft definitely. too, right? It's a it's a little bit of a, a change there. Are you enjoying this part of it? Definitely. Um, it's just giving me a lot more free time to think about a lot of things, like to look at a lot more things, like going over film of uh, past players that played at South Carolina and stuff like that, like just seeing how they came into the game and like getting pointers from Izzy and JC, just seeing how it is coming into the process and coming uh, coming into the first year. I wanted to ask you about that. JC Horner is a name that a lot of our listeners will know, obviously first round pick a couple of years ago. Yeah. Your former teammate, how much has he told you about this time and getting ready for what's coming next for you? And just how much from his game have you tried to incorporate into your own? I mean, coming in, like, coming in right off the bat, uh, I was supposed to come in in uh, January, but I didn't. But I still stayed around them boys and all of that stuff during the spring and stuff like that, came up to the practice and stuff like that. So since then, I've been learning from him, making sure that, like, he's just always been on me, making sure that I'm – good and I'm making sure that I can be the best cam I can be like because he knows the full potential that I can have on the field so just being like being there for me and stuff like that just have had a really like big impact on what I've, I've done so far. Obviously he's already established himself as a very very good corner at the NFL level a lot of respect obviously so for us covering the Patriots for the SEC. Bill Belichick loves his SEC guys he knows Definitely. that's that's the best of the best right there. When it comes to your role at the next level how do you see that playing out do you envision yourself as being a primarily man-to-man -man guy would you would you relish that sort of job moving forward how do you picture it uh definitely would relish that job just being that, that top corner that top dude on the on the team and just solidify my name in the nfl as a man-to-man -man corner so yeah i feel like that's my skill set and that's what my skill set gonna be in the next level what's your mentality you know i love talking to guys who love to play man-to-man -man coverage because it just feels like you need to get yourself to a certain place to be able to line across from somebody on the line of scrimmage, be able to try to press them off the line of scrimmage. And it just takes a certain level of aggressiveness almost to be able to perform that job and perform it well. But take us inside your mind. You're lining up from any number of star receivers that you saw in the SEC this past year. What's going on in between your ears? I mean, I don't really too much think about it. I mean, I just know I'm him. Like, I know I'm that. Like, I ain't really got to say too much or do too much about, like, about the thing, I just got to stay to my technique, stay to my, my fundamentals, and just be me. When it comes to the physical portion of your gig, how much do you enjoy that? Because just watching some of your tables, just watching some of it here right before we started talking, it's very apparent you don't mind tackling. And yeah. I don't think we could say that about everybody that plays your position, Cam. So take me into why you approach that part of the game the way you do. Um, I think it was the 2020 season or like 2019 season. One of those seasons, uh, I was coming in. I seen like it was like a little report that said I was a poor tackler. I like lacked aggression, stuff like that, like aggressive plays, stuff like that. Things like just things like that. And I kind of take took it personally because being a kind of on the on the smaller side of being a corner and stuff like that, people don't really think you'll come up and hit, don't get aggressive and stuff like that. So just trying to put that in my game has been a real big part of it. You would be as it stands right now. If the Patriots were to draft you, you'd actually be one of the bigger corners on the team because you're right, is it six feet? Yeah. Just under 200, is that what we're shooting for? What are you shooting for at the combine when it comes uh, to measurements? Right now, um, right now I'm 188. I'm trying to shoot for like 192. Okay. Again, you'd be you'd have good size for the Patriots, and it, it's clear it shows up on your tape that you don't mind throwing your weight around yeah. in that way. Also, the speed is apparent too. Just said, you're invited to the combine. Exactly. Hit us with a number. What are we planning on running in the combine this year? Uh... Right now, I'm just trying to run the low four fours. Just keep it around there. We're gonna see what's gonna happen. That that'll play. That'll play at the yeah. NFL level. I think a lot of teams would be more than happy to have six foot corner with the aggressiveness that you have, the athleticism that you have, including Bill Belichick. What would it be like to play for Bill Belichick? Oh, that'd be that'd be a great thing. He's had multiple corners having Stephon Gilmore. I've been talking to him a lot lately, and just 
coming like coming into a hole of him coming into a hole that one season just coming in they had a defensive player of the year like that was big like he was always man to man it wasn't really no other help he had like any so it was just all on him and all on bill like putting him in a position to let him let him do that what do you respect most about gilmore's game because that's again that's that's a guy that our audience are very very familiar with and people love watching him play again he had that aggressive mindset soft-spoken guy but he had that that dog in him out on yeah, the field. Definitely a soft spoken guy. Uh, but yeah, him just like just the way he prepares, I, you can tell he watches a lot of tape. Like just the way he mirrors receivers, mirrors routes, and stuff like that. So he always knows like what's coming and what he's going to get. So he's always in a good position. Kim, you are here with Saks underwear, yes, sir. and for people who aren't familiar, you know, New England region. Maybe they aren't familiar with the quote, but Cam had one of the all-time quotes this year. Asked about halftime adjustments. You guys beat up on Tennessee. You were asked about halftime adjustments after the game. He said, nothing. Just drop your nuts. Just a phenomenal quote. I think everybody is now suddenly become the biggest Cam Smith fan in the NFL when it comes to New England fans. But tell us about Sack's underwear. I mean, just coming in, like they just gave us a lot of love off to the team, off the team rip. Just coming in, uh, I love a lot about the drop temp, just the drop temp uh, underwear, just keeping you cool throughout the whole season, not the whole season, but like the whole game and stuff like that, just practices and stuff like that, just keeping, make sure that your balls are are good, make sure they're getting dry. Trying to keep those things cool, Yeah. right, when you're under pressure. I could use them. I could use them when I'm doing my interviews here on Radio Row. Definitely. I think they'd even help me out. So it's not just, you don't just have to be a future NFL star cornerback. You could be a regular Joe like myself as well. That's yes, what you're sir. saying. Okay, there we go. Cam Smith, thanks so much for being with us here in Next Bets. This was great. We had some fun with Cam Smith, didn't we? And how about Sacks Underwear? Getting a free shout out on the Next Pats podcast. Their sales should be booming after this podcast hits the internet. Thanks so much, guys, for listening. We covered a lot of ground today from Mel Kuyper to Christian Gonzalez to Dalton Kincaid to Sacks Underwear and all of our prototypical Patriots names. Appreciate you listening, guys. As always, stick with us. We're taking you up to and through the draft. Two more episodes before night one of the draft in a couple of weeks. So excited. I'm sure you are as well. A lot of different directions for the Patriots to go in. We've got a couple great guests lined up for you for these next few episodes. So we're going to continue to hammer you with draft content until we get to the draft. And then again, once we know who the Patriots have, we don't stop there. We're going to be diving deep on each and every one of these Patriots picks. So keep it with us on Next Pats. We'll talk to you next week on our next edition.